Hello and welcome to Making Games with me, Radzi, in association with Finnebrogue's Naked Bacon, the biggest revolution to happen to British breakfast in a generation, and the University of Derby, where they make it real. Now, today's guest is, quite frankly, a strongman legend. He's the 2016 Europe's Strongest Man. He's a two-times Britain's Strongest Man winner, and an 11 times, I hope I haven't miscounted them, World's Strongest Man competitor, Lawrence Charley. Welcome to Making Games, sir. I'm excited to be here, buddy. Thank you for having me. Mate, it's great to have you here. I mentioned you're a legend of Strongman. Can we go back to the first time I ever saw you compete, which was when you became Europe's strongest man? Because people remember Eddie Hall's deadlift, for obvious reasons, 500 kilos, but not necessarily that many people remember what came afterwards, which was you defeating the mountain. But the actual entire performance was incredible. Yeah, it was a it was a good day for me. Uh, it was a good day for British strongman, to be honest. Obviously, Eddie breaking the record was unbelievable. Um, but I I'd been training hard for that contest. It was weird because I'd been filming on um, the the second Kingsman film. I was working on that for about five weeks leading up to Europe's Strongest wow. Man. Wow! So I was kind of doing extremely long days. You know what filming's like. Um, and I was staying at, do you, do you know Dave Beatty? Yeah, of course, legend, Bulldog. Yeah, Bulldog, Dave Beatty, powerlifting legend. He's always around in the background of strongman shows. Uh, real good friend of mine, someone that's helped me out for since I started, to be honest. Since I think my first Britain Strongest Man, I met him and he's become a great friend of mine. And um, <clears throat> sorry, just dry throat. Absolutely, mate. But, um, Dave let me go and he's got like a, a little private gym in his house. So I was sleeping on his sofa and training at kind of, you know, 11 o'clock at night, sleeping on his sofa up at five. I'd go to the studios, you know, you have to be in makeup for like half six. You do these long days filming and then it'd be back uh, training at his sleeping on his sofa. Um, and that was my life for eight, uh, for kind of five weeks leading up to Europe's. It was it was quite good because although the filming is quite draining and you and we do like a lot of physical stuff, a lot of the time I was just able to rest. And the great thing being on set is there's awesome food everywhere. <laughs> so I could kind of I could just kind of focus on 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 the filming that I needed to do, and then chilling out in my I had like a little caravan. <laughs> so nice, mate. So I just chilled out. Vega. As much as I could. Yeah, so I was just chilling out as much as I could, trying to. Just rest, really. Um, I, I mean, for a lot of people, it wouldn't be ideal prep. And, and I guess, you know, it wasn't. Tra sleeping on a sofa, for instance, isn't isn't the best for, for a strong man. But because I was so distracted doing all these other things, I wasn't really thinking about the competition. I, I'd go to the gym and train. But then it was a whole day of filming, and that was exciting, working with these, you know, amazing actors and stuntmen and directors, etc. So mentally, I wasn't really thinking too much about strong man. But I was training really hard and, you know, I knew my sessions were good. Um, and the great thing with that, that Europe's, I knew some of the events were really good for me. Right. And I've, I've said many times, you know, with the right set of events that I believe I can beat anyone in the world. And I, I went into that competition really relaxed because I wasn't a favorite. But and I kind I kind of like that. I'm I, I prefer being the underdog. Obviously, Half Thor was the heavy favourite. We had a lot of other big names in the contest that were doing really well that year. And I was kind of on the comeback trail because the year before, uh, World Strongest Man, yeah. I retired because I got crushed by this um, makeshift Fingal's finger that they turned into what they called a Norse hammer. Uh, you know, it was a really devastating experience for me at Worlds, and, and I kind of didn't want to do Strongman. But and just to I jump in there, mate, you were absolutely devastated. You could see that on the TV screen. The way you kind of said, that's it, I'm done. These guys are incredible. I've been hanging with them for a long time, but now it's time for me to kind of, you know, hang up my laces or whatever. It was, yeah. it was so clear that that wasn't kind of a knee-jerk reaction. It was really tough because up until 2012, I was up and coming and getting better and better every year. I was kind of doing closer and closer in big competitions, getting on podiums. I won a number of international shows all over the world. Uh, at Europe's Strongest Man 2012, I was third 
behind Zadrunas and Lalas, who went on to be first and second at World's Strongest Man that year. But 2012, I went to China and I, I ended up tearing my labrum yeah. in an event that we were doing a dumbbell event in the rain and we were being rushed to get through it. And stupidly, I kind of missed, well, it was just wet and slippy and I tried to chuck the dumbbell up, it kind of slipped. And I tried to push it when it wasn't in the right position, ended up tearing my labrum. And that kind of set me back on, and it set me onto kind of a, a number of injuries that I ended up having. Cause I was always trying to rush back uh, just cause I felt the pressure that I needed to be competing. Um, and obviously I'd kept coming back from these injuries and then 2015 at worlds, I'd got myself in good shape again and then ended up devastating injury. It was visually really horrible to, to you know, it looked like I got completely crushed. Luckily right. the stopper actually stopped this thing coming down, crushing me. But if it did, it could have been 10 times worse. Uh, and I kind of lost the love for it for a little while. And then my family and my wife kind of, I, pro I was probably just driving them nuts. She told me to just get to the gym and, and get out of her hair um, and kind of just slowly started enjoying it again. And I went to Britain's Strongest Man 2016. I hadn't really trained properly, um, but just enjoyed it. Had loads of fun, ended up coming third at Britain's without putting much effort in. I thought, well, if I can do that, if I get like knuckled down and really focus, then I can, I can do well in some big shows and the kind of hunger and, and the love for it came back. And yeah, I was training real hard for 2016 Europe's real quietly. I wasn't kind of boasting or anything like that saying I could win. I just, I just wanted to go and enjoy it. That was the, the key for me. And it started pretty well. I, I did okay on the deadlift. Um, I mean, just, just to, shy of the 440, I think from memory. Yeah, yeah, and it was weird because, you know, I tore my lat a few years before and my deadlift was kind of world-class at the time. Yeah. And it, it's never kind of quite come back since that. But I, I did enough to score good points. And then we got into some of my good events and I, I was just on fire. I broke two world records in, in, in the frame carry and then in the car walk, putting a decent performance in on the log. And then the final event, which is the Stones, which is notoriously not my best event, I managed to come third in. And it was, Half Thor made a couple of mistakes and it just gave me the opportunity to pounce and, and, and take the title. And it was, it's still now, you know, within the strongman, it's my proudest moment winning, winning Europe's for sure. It was an incredible moment because there was the mistake that was made by Half Thor. And then there was the realization from the crowd where I was sat that Loz has just won this. But also for me, so you look at your car walk, frame carry, you think, okay, these really good events for Loz, no one in the world, certainly at the time, is going to compete with you at those. But at the same time, to have deadlift where it's rising bar, it's not for reps, it's rising bar, I, I think from memory on your 440, you basically get it to your knee, you almost rock back to try and hitch it. In your head, you must be thinking about what's happened to you in Gateshead. One of the worst strongman injuries I've seen with your torn lat. You then on logs is the scenario of again addressing the labrum issue so you actually had a lot of demons to overcome as well as having the, the sort of the, the good run of events you had that in the back of your mind i imagine oh definitely and it's kind of funny you mentioned the deadlift because pre lat tear and if you kind of look back at some of my earlier deadlifts i would have kept trying to pull that you know right. I, I didn't have an off switch and and sometimes that destroyed my ability in a full competition because I'd kill myself on that one event. Whereas this time round, I pulled the 420 quite well. The 440, I just couldn't quite get it high enough to kind of get my hips through. And I remember thinking for a split second, put this down. <laughs> you know, was like, There's four more events, put this down and move on to the next event. Whereas before that, I would have kept trying and pushing myself. And, you know, sometimes I guess you do have to learn from, from some of the, the, the negatives that you've had. And, and it probably made me a better all round athlete, even though some of my lifts I had to kind of give a little on, uh, I think it helped me be better at preserving energy, making sure I was kind of good for a, a full competition rather than just doing one or two events. And then you know, you're kind of done. What did it actually mean to you to be crowned Europe's strongest man? It was huge because I'd been so close in a lot of big competitions before. I was kind of like always the nearly man. Uh, I, I'd kind of done well. Obviously, I'd won the British and stuff, but 
you kind of, for how good I was at the time, I felt I deserved more. Right. Um, and I kind of so many times kind of had those knockbacks, um, various different kind of bad injuries, particularly at World's Strongest Man. But, you know, Europe's tearing my lat was, was really devastating. Um, and a number of other times where I kind of got so close, but couldn't quite get over the line. So to, to win such a major contest, not just a major contest, but it was the first time we had a huge arena show. We'd done the, right. the, the, the stadium shows at the um, at Headingley, yep. which were great with about four or 5,000 people there. But this indoor arena with 10 to 12,000 fans, the atmosphere was just incredible. Yeah. And obviously we had the 500 kilo deadlift. The fans were going nuts. Um, there was Thor who was almost seen as unbeatable at the time and to go there and me to win that show when no one was talking about me, you know, even having a, a glimmer of hope, it, it was just an amazing feeling. And it was kind of as much as it was kind of like elation and, and, you know, you are so happy that I won. It was also like relief that I've done it. I've won a major show in strongman and it was like off my back. If you, you know, you felt yeah. like, I kind of, you know, even if I don't win worlds or, or anything like that, I felt like I'd done something of, of great significance in the sport and, and, you know, left my mark, if you like. Do you remember the moment, that actual moment of realisation that you had actually won? Do you, actually, do you sort of specifically remember that? Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I thought I'd won and like people were kind of like, people weren't sure they were kind of like adding up points and stuff, but I knew what I needed to do on the stones and, and I knew I'd had a good stone run for me because, you know, people were saying I'd won before the stones, but Hafthor was such a good stone lifter and stones weren't necessarily my best event. But I knew by kind of, I, I did all, all five stones. It was the heavier set of stones as well. So the 200 kilos was the last one. Uh, and I knew that I'd, I'd done a decent time. So I was fairly confident that I got it. But once you get that official announcement, it's like, relief <laughs> you can kind of relax I actually went up to Liz and, and she was wearing quite a low cut top and I had tacky on me that stuck to her top and kind of pulled her top away to to reveal her cleavage to the world <laughs> luckily it wasn't caught on camera otherwise she would have killed me but um <laughs> it was it was funny but it was just a, an amazing night and and you know it just huge relief but um huge kind of joy as well and like you know it was 2016 probably 11 years of hard work that I put into the sport to that point um to, to win such a major show was just a, a, a massive achievement for me that's the one that you won if you like but what was the best Laurent Charlie in terms of so move performance to one side in terms of the man who's arrived at the arena the stadium whatever it might be when did you feel that you were at your absolute best it's weird. I actually feel like I was at my best in 2012. Okay. Um, I think I, I was kind of like constantly on the up. And I think 2012, I was just getting better and better. I was, I won a number of Champions League shows. I was kind of, you know, really closing in on Zadrunas in a number of the big shows that we were doing. He, he beat me a lot of times, but I was getting closer and closer to, to beating him. And whenever he wasn't there, I'd win a lot of the Champions League shows. Um, and I, I felt like, you know, it was a matter of time before I could beat him. And unfortunately, I ended up injuring myself. And, you know, yeah. if I look back, I, I would have, you know, now I, I help a lot of up and coming athletes. And, and I, I try and learn from a lot of the mistakes that I made. And I used to compete too often. That was a, a big mistake that I made early on in my career. Um, and I, I wish I didn't, but you can't kind of change it. So from 2012, I, I, I was then trying to chase to get back to my best uh, and because I didn't allow myself to fully recover from injuries and you know do the work that I should have done I was just trying to get back into to competing and back then you know strong trying to do strongman professionally was just stupid there was no money back in 2012 um, and I was trying to sort of get prize money and stuff like that to, to pay bills and do it as a full-time job and I, I shouldn't have <laughs> I should have been okay. like right have a year off rebuild yourself and then come back and that would have been the smarter thing to do but that's easy to say in hindsight well here's a question so i remember hearing a gb athlete i won't say his name but he was speaking to michael johnson 
And Michael Johnson, for those who aren't into athletics, one of the greatest sprinters of all time, one in Incredible. his home. Right. One in 1996 did the double 400, 200 in golden spikes. Unbelievable. This athlete said to Michael, Michael, how do I win? And I remember thinking, I'm listening to this answer. Yeah. And, and Michael said, the problem with you Brits is you never compete. Now, context to that is in his book, Michael Johnson talks about the fact that every week he used to compete and he used to compete even in high school events and college events. He said, because I need to know, he said, I'm not looking to run a certain time, but I'm looking to execute a strategy. He went, because I want to know that come the Olympic final, a world final, whatever it might be, where whatever condition my body is in at any given moment in time in that track, I know how to get the most out of my body. It doesn't mean world record, but it does mean I'll get the most. So where is the balance between competing enough that you've learned the skill of managing competition? You've seen how many people bottle it when it comes to the actual event versus not doing too much damage to your actual body in the process. I think it's a, it's a real fine balancing act. I think I, I became very good at peaking at competitions. I was, I always managed to bring more out of myself in a competition. And actually, if you look at volume of, of podiums and wins at international competitions, I have more international wins than any other British athlete in the last, you know, 20 years. Is that right? Um, yeah, but I, I did a lot of competitions as well. Um, so I often get kind of criticized that I always get injured. Well, if you go back and look at how many shows I did, I don't always get injured. And I, I've won more shows than anyone else. So I'm, wow. I'm kind of proud of that. Um, I'm actually, I think I'm fourth or fifth all time best performances in the Giants live shows. Is that in, Wow. In terms of victories and, and podiums. I think um, Thor is possibly first as a Drunus, And then I think it's Eddie and me, the next two okay which is is quite cool um yeah but yeah so I, I i know how to compete and i think that probably was down to to doing so many shows the problem is strongman got a lot heavier as my career kind of progressed so it went from you know when i started in the kind of 2000s shows were a lot lighter and you could get away with doing more and then the standard of the guys got better and the shows got heavier and heavier and heavier and then you couldn't turn up to shows at 80% anymore. You had to be 100% right. or <clears throat> you just wouldn't be in the in the contest. So I think, you know, I ended up a couple of years, maybe I did 18 to 20 shows in a year, which was just ridiculous. Whereas I think now, earlier on in your career, you can get away with doing maybe eight, eight to 10. And then I think as you get better and better, it's you've got that experience. You need to back off competing all the time. You look at someone like Brian Shaw, he does like two shows a year. Okay, um, yeah. You get some others that do a lot more. I'm, I mean, look at Kiliashkovsky or um, uh, who else? I mean, uh, Novikov. He, he's kind of renowned for doing lots of shows. Uh, th this last year, we can't really compare because there's not been as many shows. But I think this second half of the year, we've got a lot of shows coming up. And the athletes are going to have to be quite selective about what they do. They're not going to be able to do every single major show because they're too heavy and they're going to risk destroying their bodies, getting injuries. So they need to be selective about what's the most important to them. And then you can do the other shows, but you say to yourself, well, this is a, a warm up show. It's going to be a training session rather than I'm going there to, to win the title. So with that in mind, then what for you could be the future of strongman where we know that we can't have guys competing every week, but is there a way in your head of potentially having a league or a championship or something that means that we have a season that, that could even last eight months of the year rather than just random promoters doing random things and it just kind of being a hodgepodge? I, I would love to see some kind of unity between all the different shows because at the moment you just have maybe five or six different promoters putting on their own shows and all great shows, all different at what they're good at. Um, and, and it's great that the athletes have more and more opportunities now, but there's no sort of system that feeds people into to the best shows. And it is a real difficult one. You know, World's Strongest Man is still the biggest show. 
you know, regardless of what people will say, because people will say, oh, the Arnold is better or worse is better or what in terms of prize money, perhaps they are. But in terms of prestige, the world's strongest man is still the show that everyone wants to win. Right. So I'd like to see a, a proper qualifying system. I mean, Giants Live have the official qualifying tour, which is great. Um, but you still end up with a lot of wild cards. And, and, you know, I'd like to see opportunities for people in different regions. So we have like the, you know, Australian champions, African champions, sort of South America, North America, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. You know, lots of different regions. And then we really start developing this as a worldwide sport rather than a few sort of select areas that... You know, we, we it always goes in cycle. America's very popular, Britain, Eastern Europe, but the rest of the world is still kind of catching up. And there's some great athletes in some of these areas that would do fantastic at, at strongman contests. And to that point, is you take some of the boys in NFL. So there is um, the I mean, they call it the strip curl. I would argue it isn't particularly strict, but strip curl. You've got a couple of guys in the NFL with whatever training they're doing in the gym they're having a pop at the unofficial world record. Is there then an argument that what you could possibly do is rather than have, let's say, just pure strongman, and that's the only way to compete, that you could almost have spectacles, so whether it is strict curl, bench press, whether it, and bench press comes under powerlifting, but maybe it wouldn't be under IPF rules where we need to worry about the bar being flat, the bar, let's say, not pausing, etc. It's just locked arm, Touch chest, locked up. What would you think about that kind of concept? I think it has its place, definitely. Like, um, uh, I, I've seen certain contests, like at a smaller level. Um, I'm supposed to be emceeing a show called The Odd Lifts, you know, where they do... I love already. They, they, they do like a strict press. They do like a bicep curl. They've got the um, the disabled deadlift, which is like a yes. deadlift. It's not really a deadlift, but it's a great lift, and you see some huge numbers lifted. Um, so I have no issue with things like that. I think it's cool to see who's the best at certain different things. I mean, essentially, strongman is that. You know, it's challenging yourself in lots of different areas. Um, and a lot of a lot of the the original strongman events were sort of different. Different regions have their traditional feats of strength. Like in Scotland, they've got the stones, Iceland, you know, etc. There's there's lots of weird feats of strength that people did in their certain areas and then strongman kind of put it all together and see who's the best all-round athlete um so you, you're kind of talking of just people focusing on one lift yeah well it was just the idea that then because as you were speaking i was thinking it's a conversation we've had before but also it was then the idea that well if we know that guys can only compete a maximum of let's say 10 times a year how could we then create a system where crowds can watch strongman throughout the year and so one is that you treat it like boxing and that you'd have, let's say, two guys or three guys, four guys have a competition together. Or you do it as, right, this week, Loz is going to be competing in, let's say, Hammerhold or whatever it might be. But you're doing one, maybe two events rather than a full five that's going to just batter you in every department. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 I like the idea of team competitions. Um, lighter weight competitions, women's competitions, you know, challenging. Uh, well, I think we spoke about this as well, didn't we? Like, you know, everyone wants to see the heavyweights. But I think if you start letting people see the personalities, you'll then start enjoy watching the different classes. You know, it's, it's the same in, in fighting sports. Originally, people want to see the best big guy against the next best big guy. But now the mentality's changed. You know, we, we, we love watching the lighter weight guys. Um, and often they're a lot more skillful. Uh, I'm, nice. I'm not even talking about boxing and things now. You look at the lighter weight lifters, technically they're often a lot better than the heavyweights. Right. The heavyweights are just super freaks. <laughs> Whereas the, the lighter weight guys are often the technical kind of experts and they understand how to get the most out of their body. Um, and there's great characters in, in under 105, strong man in 90s, in the ladies classes. And I, I'd like to see more, kind of crossovers into to those classes and then maybe you know really odd competition I, I like team competitions so either two or four man teams are great but then you could have america versus the united kingdom where you have right you have like a couple of heavyweights a couple of lightweights 
different, you know, oh, maybe heavyweight yeah. female, a lighter weight female, and you compete as a team. I think that would kind of be quite entertaining. And then people can get behind their countries. Uh, it could be an interesting format. That's really, I hadn't thought of that actually, because yeah, and then you reduce the number of events per athlete, but you've then got the synergy of the country, the rivalry. Because yeah. I think one of the things that for me, say, is lacking in the lighter weight strongman and strongwoman is the fact it doesn't look very good. And what I mean by that is, it's often, let's say a frame carry. It's actually modified farmers with, let's say, four red plates on, where a lot of blokes sat at home and go, oh, I could do that. Whereas sure. in Giants Live, with Giants events, you're then seeing things that are just larger than, so that frame they've got just looks incredible. And I think that's <laughs> I a totally, really important part I totally part of agree with you. And I think visually how things come across is very important. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite events to watch is something like a car flip, car roll. Right. I, I just think it looks cool. Yeah. It really <laughs> ways. It just looks cool. The, the car, you know, the, the, the car run, car yoke, I like that. I think it looks cool. The big frames that they use at the Giants Lives. I'm not such a fan sometimes of the max deadlift with Alico plates because, I mean, it's great for people that lift, but for people, just as an example, I put a video up of me doing a competition in the Faroe Islands and I deadlifted on this long bar with lots of kind of Hummer tires, a bit like the Hummer deadlift, but just a, a lower version. It was by no means the heaviest deadlift I've ever done. But visually, it looked immense. And that got such a, a bigger response than some of the lifts I've done in the gym, which were more weight, but just with, you know, powerlifting, uh, uh, calibrated plates. It just doesn't look as impressive. That's part of the problem, I think, with Olympic throwing, is that you see the hammer and the guy sling it around and off it goes, or shot put. And you go, okay, that, that stone or in, in their case, their shot goes X feet, X meters. It looks quite cool. But it's not until you pick up that shot and you go, what? This is how much yeah. it weighs. The same with the hammer. Whereas if, if you can communicate that, it becomes so much more majestic. You think, but this is unbelievable. And, and then it becomes larger than life. And then it becomes a spectacle. And then I have buy-in. And that, to be fair, although I think stones are overused, I think Atlas stones just look larger than life. And you just think, flip it now. I don't fancy lifting that myself. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. It needs to be visually impressive. And, you know, the bigger and more extreme it looks, the better. I, I'd love to see the old-fashioned backlift come back. Right. You can, create, okay. you can create such a huge. I mean, the, the problem is is cost, and then kind of storing such a an item, or, or taking it to different places. But now that you know, guys are, like the Giants Live team have a, an actual team that travel around, they've got their own lorries, etc. Build something impressive like that, and I think it would be awesome, and also difficult for people to train. You see, I like what it. gutted me a little bit, and I've got to be honest, ahead of this year's world, so the announcement of Finkel's Fingers, and my first thing was, amazing, people aren't going to be able to train with it. You said you've you'd be surprised. Training. Right, mate. And so <laughs> many people have got them customised, got them fabricated. And again, I get it, because these guys are dedicated, they want to win, and fair play to it. It makes me respect them even more. But just it shows that shows how much the sports advanced and you know right. back back in the 80s no one even touched equipment to train on now you know late 90s early 2000s a couple of the top guys used to make their own now you can buy equipment right you know, it's manufactured and, and there's gyms all over the world that have strongman equipment in so for for be, becoming more specific at these events it's become a lot easier and that's why you know you can't compare bill kazmaier on a cutout blog with yes. kind of branches coming off it and you know, <laughs> probably imagine how unstable that was to the laser precision cut you know slater logs that we see used these days you just can't compare those lifts they're, they're, they're it's night and day i was asking jeff capes about this and about the difference between calibrated versus not and he just said i cannot communicate to you the difference it makes where 
you've got two handles which ultimately aren't even in the actual center of the mass. <laughs> you know, it's just a different lift entirely. He went, so what you're really seeing is suboptimal lifts, but suboptimal lifts with guys using suboptimal kit that they've never even touched before. And, they, and I, even as I'm speaking, I'm torn because a part of me thinks I'm so pleased it's moved on. And another part of me goes, oh, but there's something so pure about that. How would you like to see a contest where the guys now did the original World's Strongest Man events? Oh, mate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, hang on. I'd How love to see got... that. Is it so? Seventy-seven was that? That was the first. Seventy-seven was the first. So, what would it be for to twenty twenty-seven? Would that be fifty years? Uh, be... Yeah, fifty years. There's one year yeah. that it was missing, but um, yeah. So fifty years since the original. Oh, mate, that would be so. Okay, question then to yourself: Who would win? <laughs> <laughs> I think when you look at like what the events were back then, yeah, someone like no Novikov is so adaptive. I think he 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 he's someone that seems to be able to figure event. And there's been a few guys like this over the years. I mean, a couple that spring to mind: Magnus Ver, Marius right. Kudzinowski, um, Jean Paul Sigmundson as well. Actually, they were great at figuring events out. They they may they might not have been the strongest guys in the gym, but they were just great at working out events and figuring out how to use their body in the most effective way. They would watch other people, they would try things, and those guys just had this ability to to bring out a little extra than the next guy. And that's, that's a great ability in strongman. People don't know how much Colin Bryce knows about that side of things, because I remember hearing him have a conversation with Maggie Bear about that exact thing, where Maggie, we were talking about an event, I can't remember what it was, and he just immediately went, if you want to get a few extra seconds out of that, what you want to do is. And I thought, that had ne just never dawned on me. And especially in something where guys are, like if someone said to you just before Hercules holds, Loz, just a quick one, mate. You're not in a mind space to be having tips. Of, you're so zoned in. You're so alpha at that point. You're so angry and focused, whatever you want to describe it as being. <coughs> but Maggie, when he used to lift, they, they didn't see, it was almost a bit similar to Zadrunas. There was almost this, not quite relaxation, but almost a, a real presence, isn't they are presently thinking as they're doing. And that, I think, speaks to their success, actually. Totally. Um, I was just thinking another, another guy that was very good at figuring things out was um, Derek Poundstone as well. Oh, uh, right. He okay. Really smart. He used to kind of like, especially things like rocks to press and stuff like that. He had a, a real knack of, of just slight, just feeling things with his hands and figuring things out. It was, um, it, I remember competing with him in a few shows and his ability to, to just work things out was very impressive. Mate, backstage when you're at these comps, could you kind of describe, say, for example, Worlds, what actually takes place? Because what really surprised me was when I first worked at Giants Live is in my I don't know why I thought this, but for example, you've got deadlift out of the front. In my head, there'd be platforms and everyone would be deadlifted. And actually, there's one deadlift bar. Everyone has to decide what goes on that bar. And then people just take turns and you could be almost not deadlifting for six, seven minutes while you're waiting for your turn. Yeah, it's not ideal backstage. Um, it has got better. So if we're talking World's Strongest Man, yes. say we're warming up for the squat, there would be a forklift truck in the back with a bar on it. <laughs> so that would be um, and quite often they'd be like, oh, we need the forklift now. So you've got to kind of put the, the, the weight down. And <laughs> it's, it's terrible. When Rogue came up, they started kind of investing some warm-up kit, but we're talking a rack. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's still not ideal. I, I remember doing a show, a super series show in Sweden. The first event was a super yoke, 450 yoke. Um, at the time, that was pretty heavy. There was no warm-up kit whatsoever. 
So my warm up was getting under this yoke. I lifted it up. I saw stars. I put it down. I walked away. <laughs> that was that was the warm up. Wow. Yeah, a bit of mobility and stretching, but yeah, w- um, weight wise, I got under the weight of the competition, picked it up, saw stars, put it down, and <laughs> that was me done. <laughs> so what about you? I actually won the event. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked. Uh, what about say plane pull, truck pull? What can you do? What would you? How would you warm up for that? So <laughs> often you'd be grabbing one of the other competitors, getting into a bit of a <laughs> rummage with them. Uh, you might get some bands just to kind of warm the biceps up. So you're kind of like mimicking, kind of pulling a, a rope. Uh, often you see the guys kind of stretching against the vehicle or against the wall, just trying to stretch out their calves. But um, yeah, warm up facilities are not the best at strongman competitions. Uh, so even at Worlds, so I don't know, you've got, what could, so Fingal's Fingers, would there even be a replica there for you to use? No, no. There's a bar. There's a barbell. Mm. These days at World's Strongest Man, you've got a barbell, some weights. Um, occasionally, they might have like a lighter bit of kit. So like if there's a frame carry, you might be lucky and get some farmer's walks. Um, there might be a backstage, like a lighter yoke that you could warm up with, but that's new. <laughs> you know, right. you go back to my first worlds, the warm up equipment was diabolical. That's that's really interesting because a lot of guys in the gym, you know, you've got a one rep max, you'll be warming up for about an hour for that, and it'll be mm. methodical. It'll be, I'll know all the incremental jumps I'm going to be making <coughs> right the way up to the lift. Whereas, actually, for the biggest even, competition, even like, life, um. Even like in some of the, the one-day shows where we warm up for the deadlift, for instance, you'll be warming up, and normally in the gym you might have a certain amount of time that you wait between your lifts, but you have to then go through the, you know, the, the, the walkouts, the walk-ons, for instance. So you might have done your last warm-up lift, then you've got yeah. to go and walk out with the flags, greet everyone, then you kind of sent back. Then you kind of, you know, the, the first athlete comes out. Sometimes you can be waiting a hell of a long time before you do an actual lift. So it's quite hard to st- strategically plan what numbers you're going to do up, do up in the warm up, when you're going to do them to, to be optimal in terms of performance. And you have to be laid back and just get on with it. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation for a lot of people. And you see some guys in the gym that are amazing and they crumble under that kind of pressure. I'm quite lucky I'm laid back about it. You know, if people, someone says it's time to go, all right, it's time to go. I'm not going to stress about it. But some guys really struggle. And, and you do see it. You see these guys that post these ridiculous numbers in the gym, comes to competition day, and they just crumble because they cannot cope with, with the timings, with what's going on, with the distractions. And that's, um, you know, it's a tough part of the sport that you have to learn. How do you manage, say, for example, arriving in the arena, and it could be perhaps at 3 p.m., doors don't open till six you might be doing the vvips where you meet some of the crowd you then go for your warm-up how do you actually manage that process is it just a case of you learn just to almost accept that it is what it is yeah you just kind of get on with it you try and make sure your food is pretty good um my most important thing on a comp day is hydration so that is kind Uh. of key for me uh suffered with cramp kind of early part of my career something i've learned to manage quite well um and i've i found managing hydration for me is more important than food on the day of a competition interesting um a lot of people think about food to be honest the food that you eat leading up to the competition is important but the day of the competition as long as you've got a good breakfast in you and then you're snacking on kind of carby type foods sugary type carb uh foods you'll be fine you, you're not trying to build muscles you don't need to have loads of protein and stuff like that you just need energy so intra workout shakes um you'll see a lot of the guys having things like haribo or some yeah. bread and yeah. peanut butter flapjacks bananas chocolate just things that are going to give them a bit of an energy spike to to get through the day you're not worried about eating like you would you know normally in, in your training do you remember the first um, time you said, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no I was just going to say, you know, the hydration side of it is is key because, be, I mean, people joke about Eddie when he goes on about hydration and stuff, but it is so important. Even if you're like, you know, 2% dehydrated, it's going to have a massive impact on your performance. So that for me is key on, on a day of a competition, especially when you think the indoor arenas, they get extremely hot. You're all those people in there. 
um and, and you need to kind of you know manage that we're big you know big huge guys one day shows in the arenas are hot the world's strongest man in these hot conditions you know you're sweating all the time so you need to be replenishing all that lost um minerals and and water basically i think to your point mate i think i'm right in saying eddie before his 500 deadlift had something like 20 500 mil lucas aids before he actually lifted something like that throughout the day because he was talking about trying to there was a science behind it. I don't want to pretend I know what it was. Um, but do you remember the first time you walked into a gym? Like, do you remember what your what you were roughly benching, squatting, etc.? Yeah, first time I went to a gym, I went with a friend, and um, he just told me to lift certain weights. So <laughs> the very first time I went in, I, I deadlift and squatted 100 kilos for sets of eight, but it was fairly easy. Um, and I trained for about a couple of months, and then I entered a strongman competition. Did you? I, yeah, I deadlifted two thirty in the gym, right? Um, thinking I was the the bollocks. Um, <laughs> a commercial gym. There wasn't really any strong guys there, um, and the competition I went to had two hundred and twenty kilos for reps, and came to the competition and I did fourteen reps with two hundred and twenty kilos. First time. Wow. Two hundred. Yeah, it was two twenty. I did fourteen reps. I was like, okay, I haven't been pushing myself very hard in the gym. And I realized I was capable of a lot more. Um, so, yeah, that was the first time I sort of really pushed myself, if you like. Uh, and my progression was pretty fast, if I'm honest. I, I went from 2005, first entering a gym, to being at my first World's Strongest Man in 2008. Wow. Oh, how, okay, how much were you weight-wise, 2005? 2005 I was still a pretty big guy I was probably about 19 stone I I kind of was very sporty I was British champion at Kung Fu I played rugby for the southwest um laughably I I used to play table tennis and I was a a table tennis coach um you know I did I was British champion at Kung Fu I I was a decent athlete I was good at sprinting and some of the throwing events I was I was decent at shot put and discus not so good at javelin and for some reason I was just terrible at javelin um but shot put particularly was was a decent event for me and I was a good sprinter as well I I could move fast which people always were shocked by but I think when they saw my movement in in terms of strongman they sort of realized okay he's quite he's actually quite explosive and, and fast but I've always been very sporty but I'd never been in a gym till 2005 when I turned 21 and then by 20, yeah, 25, 24, I was at my first Worlds. And from a Dom standpoint, I find it quite interesting hearing how different people get affected by sort of stimulus in the gym. Are you somebody that, did you, do you feel Doms a lot after a session? Because someone like Mark Felix. I'm not a freak of nature. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, particularly back then, I felt it more than I do now. Um, I trained more like a bodybuilder back then, you know, going to failure, um, where you just feel you know, like your muscles are beat up. Whereas now I'm a little bit more of a strength orientated approach to my training. So it's not about going to failure with a lot of the lifts. It's kind of understanding movement patterns and peaking at a certain time. So I, I, it's very rare. You'll see me push to the absolute limit in the gym. I'm always trying to make sure things are moving in a certain way. Um, and and you, 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 I tend to get doms if I haven't trained for a while. Right. But if I'm training regularly, it's never that bad. Uh, I, I do remember certain times where I've had some absolutely brutal, particularly leg sessions, and you can get some nasty doms for a while, particularly if you kind of throw in a session that's taking you out of your, your normal comfort zone. But normally when I'm prepping for a strongman show, it's not about that. We're trying to prep for the events that we've got coming up, making sure that I'm strong in terms of my compound movements and, and obviously trying to bring up any weaknesses in terms of you know lagging muscle groups. But it, it's a little bit different when you're training for strength to training just for pure size and, and shape in, in terms of bodybuilding. What do you think led to success? So from 2005 to 2008, you're obviously doing a lot of things right. What were those things, do you think? I don't necessarily think I was doing a lot of things right. right, I was just extremely hardworking and determined. And this is something that a lot of people can't get over. And I see it, you know, even now with, with certain athletes that are coming through. 
I had great genetics for strongman. Yeah. A lot of people can't accept that. Well, look at the size of your joints for a start. Yeah, like my training wasn't the smartest. I, luckily, after a couple of years, I met a guy called Nick McKinless who was very intelligent with his training. And he, he almost took me backwards to take two steps forwards. Right. He was like, right, your technique's crap. We need to change a few things. Whereas I was typical, I'm going to push as hard as I can. My, my mentality in terms of pushing myself was faultless. You couldn't kind of fault how determined I was. But I was leading to eventually hurt myself and i see that so often in the gym now particularly from the coaching side of you know standpoint i'm always trying to make sure people are safe and, and lifting effectively often because of mistakes i've made where I, i've ended up injured and the body will cope to a certain degree it can get away with a lot for a while but eventually you'll get caught out uh, particularly if you want to keep getting stronger because the heavier those weights get the more those little weaknesses will start to kind of cost you so when you say 2000, so when you say working really hard, do you mean intensity? Do you mean volume? Do you mean sort of the yeah, number of in, sessions? Intensity, my, my intensity, like, and, and I, you know, I would push myself to the absolute limit. If you told me to do it, I'd do it. You know, if I trained with someone, if they did 20 reps, I'd do 21. It was always a competition. Everything was about being the, the, the best I could be. My mentality was, you know, and it's funny when you look back, because when you're new, you improve really quickly doing anything. It's not until you sort of hit that brick wall and you think, all right, I've got to learn how to train properly now. But for about two years, you can get away with pretty much doing anything. As long as you're eating and pushing yourself hard, you'll get stronger. But that progress gets slower and slower the stronger you get. And it's it's very evident, you know, and I stupidly back then, I thought, well, I've improved 100 kilos on my deadlift this year. If I improve 100 kilos on my deadlift the year after, I'm going to be the world record holder. And obviously, it doesn't right. work like that. <laughs> you know, suddenly you start feeling right, well, I can only put 20 kilos on this year. Then it's like, I only put five kilos on this year. Then it's like, getting one kilo stronger becomes harder and harder. Just getting back to your best is a challenge. And it's funny when you see these kind of younger kids on their way up, they, they think it's never going to stop. It's It certainly does. And you can hit a brick wall pretty fast. Um, and sometimes you end up just getting one injury can cost you massively. You know, I've experienced that. How so do you now, program your sessions? Um, I program normally, I, I do kind of like four-week blocks um, for, for, for my training. Uh, normally, it depends. Like I've programmed my training for Europe for um, the Royal Albert Hall uh, on a 16 week training block broken down into four blocks. Um, and it's kind of like you build up and then you kind of drop back a little bit. You build up, you drop back a little bit, build up, drop back a little bit. Um, and I've only got five events to train for at the Royal Albert Hall, which makes it much easier. When I was training full time in terms of looking to compete at Worlds and that becomes a lot harder because you've got so many aspects that you're trying to focus on. Um, like right now, I just need to train for axle frame, the axle deadlift, Hercules hold and Atlas stones. So it's not too hard to program for those. Um, I'm focusing on what I need to. I've backed off on, I don't squat at the moment. I still train legs, but I'm not squatting because it allows me more recovery time to then focus on my deadlift and my events so it's just about structuring it to to suit what you're doing but normally i i kind of have like a, a hybrid powerlifting strongman kind of split where i train legs um and back once a week and i do pressing twice a week <coughs> and so how many times are you in the gym and when you were full-time now or when i was doing it full-time when you were full-time Originally, I used to train 11 times a week. You're joking. Wow. I told, I told you I, I, I used to work really, really hard, but without any thought process whatsoever. <laughs> and then I had, my old, I had my oldest daughter, which then restricted my time that I had to go to the gym, trained four times a week, and I improved. Is that right, mate? Yeah. I was allowing myself recovery time, and I, I started getting a lot better, actually. Uh, reducing my training volume. And physiologically, did you change between the 11 versus the four sessions a week? I started adding more muscle because I wasn't burning so many calories. Um, yeah, <sighs> I, I recovered quicker. 
uh, and I was able to, to actually improve my strength quicker as well. So those four sessions, how did you break those down? My training has always been pretty much a leg day, a deadlift day with assistance, and then a strict pressing day and a push pressing day. That has essentially been my training system. Uh, sometimes I've pushed up to five days a week, depending on whether I needed, if I needed to be fitter for a competition. Okay. So I'd push up to five. I trained, I got four weeks. I got an, I got invited to the Arnold's with four weeks notice. Oof. And I dropped down to three training sessions a week because it was so heavy. Yeah. I needed the extra recovery time. And it's, it's kind of weird now knowing a lot more than I used to. I get some people and they're like, I want to push so hard. I want to push harder. Like, I want to train an extra day. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't <laughs> trust me. You know, tr training less sometimes for strength is, is more. Um, you basically, you've got like your training frequency and training volume. So they're, they're the most things. If you're, if you're kind of smashing your legs in one session, you don't want to have three sessions a week. You know, you can, you can bring that volume down and then you can train more frequently, but overall it needs to you, you can't push harder than you need to because then you don't recover so it's important like sometimes i've done squats twice a week um deadlift twice a week but for me i find one deadlift session a week works best um i have got away with squatting twice a week but then i have to really reduce my volume of of leg assistance work and you know the weight that you're using so one session will become like a technical session, if you like. Right. Where you just focused on much lighter weights, working on movement patterns, and then you'll have a heavier session where you push the weights a bit more, whether it's in terms of repetition or heavier weight. And are you somebody who's got a logbook and you know the exact numbers of the exact weight you're going to do, or is it instinctive? I plan things and I allow a window of change. So uh, particularly as I'm, I've got older, whereas when I was younger, it was like, I have to stick to this. It's written yeah. down. I have to do it. Whereas now I go on feel. So I do plan out my numbers. If I'm feeling really good, I might allow myself to push 10 kilos heavier. If I'm not feeling so good, I'll back off. Um, and I, I listen to my body, particularly these days where I've had so many injuries. I'm like, well, I'm just not feeling it today. It's best to back off. Um, and, and I've kind of explained that to a lot of my clients, particularly if I'm not there to watch them, you have to understand your, and there's a difference between being lazy and something being wrong. And you, you need to be able yes. to establish that, you know, that you, you get some people and they're just lazy and you can tell they're lazy. Yeah, just, <laughs> oh, hurt. I'm, I'm, you know, my quads are hurting from a few leg extensions, but yeah, you're fine. Keep going. Whereas <laughs> there's certain athletes, you know, if there's something wrong with them because they, they don't complain normally and that you have to listen to them and, and back things off. That's, that's important because if you push and you injure yourself, that's six months recovery and six months of, of, you know, you've gone backwards if you like. So it is important to, to listen to the body and, and be, adaptable, uh, be adaptable. If we take, for example, something like log press, where for some guys it might be an issue of lack of tricep strength or it might be specific things, uh, how, how do you structure what you're doing to the, I guess, to the client now, but possibly to yourself as well? Would you then think, okay, my triceps need to be brought up, so I'm going to focus on tricep movement, or is it a, a kind of an all-round that regardless of where your weaknesses and strength points are, you'll do something quite similar? Um, I certainly do focus on certain weaker groups. A, a good example is people's squats. Often you get some people that are quite quad dominant. Uh, some people are more hamstring and glute dominant. So adjusting the way they squat can help with that. Um, for someone like myself, I'm very quad dominant. So if you watch me deadlift, I'm extremely strong off the floor and right. then my lockout isn't quite as strong. So I've, I've kind of, and it's not even sometimes weaker glutes. Sometimes it's activating the glutes can be an issue for yes. certain people. I don't know if certain people out there may find that their, their glutes get really tight. So I need to get a lot of work on them from my physio and, and chiropractor. And I, the difference when I'm firing is huge. I go from like struggling with, you know, 300 kilos to I can pull 400 easily. It's such right? a dramatic difference when my body is working 
hundred percent. But it is important to establish weaknesses, any imbalances. So I'll often get people doing unilateral work. So maybe like single Bulgarian split stance squats, for instance, yeah. single legged leg presses, whatever it might be, just because particularly people that have done sports for a long time, they develop stronger, you know, tennis players, for instance, they're going to be right side dominant. Um, and then when they come into the gym, you can see them just pushing off that right leg a little bit more. And eventually if they keep doing that, it's going to cause issues. So you need to be aware of things like that with clients and other people, they're perfectly balanced and they can get away with like bare minimum in terms of assistance work. And you can just really focus on, you know, movement patterns and then specific training drills for, for, for events that are coming up. I feel like, you're fast becoming the oracle of all things strongman right now. With what you and Liz are doing, it's something's happened. Go on Loz's channel. He'll have an update on it. So with that in mind, I've got a few questions for you about strongmen and who are the ultimates. So if we were to put together the ultimate strongman from history, including present day. So that Ooh. means we can get the strongest arms, the strongest back, the strongest legs, every element to the ultimate strongman. If we went first of all, who for you has the strongest arms in history? I think he, Magnus Samuelson was extremely well known for his arm strength. Yeah. You know, he was always good at any type of arm over arm pulling events. His grip was extremely strong. You know, when it came to arm strength, he, he was up there, obviously broke Mega Man's arm. So um, I think we'll, we'll go with Samuelson for, for arms. Strongest shoulders. You can't, you can't go for anyone other than Zadrunas when it comes to strongest shoulders. He's just absolute beast. Never really focused on records overhead, but he smashed them all. He still has the log record. I don't think he's going to have it for much longer, but he's had that record for so long. And I think if if log for was just a, a single event back in his prime, we could have seen something ridiculous put up by him. What do you reckon? What What was he capable of? I think at least 240, maybe possibly even 250. I have to say, I'm going to put it out there. I think Bibby, in the next couple of years, I think he gets the quarter ton. I think... Do you know what? I, 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 I totally agree with you. Bibby's shoulder strength is just on another planet. But he's not proved it yet in terms of what Zadrinus did over such a long period of time. Absolutely. I think he'd agree with that. Strongest back? Got to be Eddie Hall. <laughs> it has to be. You know, Eddie's deadlifting is phenomenal and uh, you know I, I really was impressed by what Hafthor did in the feats of strength but one of the most impressive deadlifts I ever saw worlds was, mate worlds, worlds yeah. 2000, you know you had Brian Shaw you had um well actually you had 10 of the strongest guys on the planet most of us were 400 plus kilo deadlifters and we'd already done I think we'd done about eight to ten events at this point um, and I've never seen a deadlift competition that's been such a high stamp. So many guys going over 440. And then you had, I think the last three guys in the comp was Thor, Brian Shaw, and Eddie. And he came out on top. So for me, that was probably my most impressive deadlift I've ever seen by Eddie Hall. I put that above his, his 500 kilos. So do I. And for me, it was also the bizarre thing. It was a non-event. That, I'm not sure if it was 471, 472, what it was, but the way that bar went up, given how pre-fatigued he was, he, given how he, he hot he would have been. Whatever he needed to pull. It was as simple as that. And at that time, no one could touch Eddie on, on the deadlift. Yeah, agreed. Strange one. Strongest triceps. Strongest triceps is difficult. Do you know who I'm going to go with? Yeah. Christoph Radzikowski. Uh, nice. Okay, yeah. Enormous Christoph's triceps. pressing power. Christoph's pressing power, particularly his tricep strength, was incredible. He couldn't quite match Cesar Drunas on a log for Max because of core strength. It wasn't shoulder and tricep strength that held him back. He would just be in, like his body was unstable and he'd be moving around, whereas Adrunas was a lot more rock steady. But you put um, Christoph on like a Viking press or something like that, just absolutely unbelievable. 
The reason I'm pleased he's on there is that means that my name is on there because we share the first five letters of the surname, Radzi and Radzi. <laughs> <laughs> Strongest forearms. Strongest forearms. Well, forearm strength is normally kind of, it, it's not really, if we, but it, it, it's a, it, it goes within kind of grip strength. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, you can't, not have Mark Felix in there. If you're talking about, I mean, Mark's got huge forearms as they are. He's got huge hands. He's a plasterer. So he's going to use it all day long. His forearms are massive. His grip's unbelievable. So let's go with the living legend that is Mark Felix. Strongest legs. Strongest legs. <laughs> there was a time I might have put myself in, in there for that. Um, I think again with strongest legs, I think you've got three guys that if we're talking strong men, um, I think Eddie's up there with the strongest legs. Zadrunas is up there with the strongest legs and Mr. Bill Kazmaier. Big Bill. I'm glad. Okay. I'll put, I'll put, a, few, I'll put a few down there. So you said um, Bill, Eddie and Z. Best competitor. Ooh, there's been a lot of great competitors. Do you know what? Because he doesn't probably get as much, much recognition as he deserves. I'm going to put Marius Pujanovsky in there. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Animal and absolutely, you know, hated losing. He competed <laughs> so often and always, always tried to beat his own personal kind of best, which uh, I, you have to admire. Even if he'd won the competition by a mile, he'd still be trying to break records. And that kind of competitiveness, you just have to respect. Best rigging strongman. I mean, just unbelievable. For me, when, you know, kind of at an age where you're getting into the gym and you see a guy like him, you think, that's who I want to look like. Then you get into the gym yeah. and you realise, that's old- who I can't look like. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're going to be strong and you look like that, you, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Strongest skeleton. <laughs> um. That's a it's a really odd question. Um, it's going to be one of like the giant guys, like maybe okay, like a so Brian Shaw or or a Thor, where they just they're so big, they're so durable, they they don't seem to get injured very often, which is a, having that size helps massive. I know some amazingly strong smaller guys, but their bodies always break down. Thor and Brian. Not that many injuries, not not se- severe injuries when you look um, at the grand scheme of things. So I would go with one of those monsters. So um, that's the first I'm going to beg to differ with you on because I think the strongest skeleton is yourself because your ability no. to bear weight, the fact that you're the way you move with the yoke and the frame carry, that to me pro- speaks the to The problem me. is my muscles and my tendons aren't <laughs> as strong as my skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about that? That was it. Five forty on that yoke in Wuss. Five eighty. Five, mate. It was absolutely ridiculous. And I was working at that, and to see guy after guy, first of all, not even move it more than three meters, five meters, to the point that they had to work out: do we keep the yoke at one end? of the, the stage and then go back the way because it's too much effort to, to keep moving it back and forth. And then all of a sudden, you turn up and made it look like it was discernibly <coughs> light. Is to the point that you think, is that the same frame? It was unbelievable. I think that's possibly my most impressive single performance in a competition ever. Not just, I mean, I've had some amazing performances on yokes where I've just kind of blitzed past everyone. But if you look at the lineup of that competition, it was literally every single top strongman at the time. Um, you know, you had Brian Shaw, Thor, you had like um, Lissis was there, Kiliushkovsky, Zadrunas, you know, Ian Bibby, some of the best kind of people on the yoke of all time. And I was five or six seconds faster than anyone. And, you know, I, I had like Zadrunas and Kiliushkovsky coming up to me afterwards saying that was just like unbelievable. So to get those type of compliments from those people meant a lot to me, for sure. 
and we talk about being pre-fatigued with Eddie in 2017, that was a long night in a lot of heat. And to do it then, when you must have been exhausted, mate. Yeah, <laughs> do you know a funny story? <laughs> I, it was such a long night. I put some deep heat on my legs and I was wearing some compression shorts. By the time the night was done, I'd burnt my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to get, I had to get into a cold bath just to kind of <laughs> leave that pain. But maybe that's why I was so quick, because I just wanted to get it done. <laughs> Mate, what kind of conditions have you competed in? Because the fact that you've had it's so some many... Of the worst. <laughs> yeah. I've competed in everything from... 45 degree blistering heat and humidity to minus 36 degrees in Lapland in where you get off the airplane and your nostrils freeze. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're carrying like snowmen <laughs> as part of the, <laughs> the contest. Um, so yeah, wow. everything in between those type of conditions. Because so I'm at minus 24 in South Korea. And walking for two minutes was, so, I mean, it was, it, there was brutal wind as well. But it was, I mean, if you said to me, Rad, did you fancy bench press? Well, no, I'm not doing anything physically. How do you cope with that? I think I was wearing about like eight layers. <laughs> it was, it was actually, it was okay during the day. The temperature wasn't too bad. It was like minus eight during the day with the sun out. It was when we were competing at night and the sun went down it became unbearably cold. Like I've never been in those kind of conditions before. To be quite honest, I don't want to be in them again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a lovely place. And I'd been before, the year before, the temperature wasn't so bad. It was sort of minus five to minus eight. But the time we went that year, it was just blisteringly cold. And I was so grumpy and just wanted to get out of it. We were doing the last event, which was this loading event where we are carrying kind of like snowman blocks and then ice blocks and i was up against um who was i up against uh, no it wasn't radzikovsky danis zagris danis zagris Liz's knowledge him. by the way for anyone who doesn't she know is, that's yeah. is unbelievable about your she, career and everyone else's she knows she knows her strong man for sure <laughs> Um, but Danis Agris was kind of like, this was his, one of his first big international shows. Danis is a, a great strongman, um, competed at Worlds, competed at Giants Live, strongman Champions Leagues. He's dominated a lot of the shows there. This was his first kind of big show. And you could see how keen he was. He'd done amazing all day. And it was him and me head to head on this loading event. I was just like a grumpy old man. I just did not want to be there. And he was like blistering out of the, the, the gates as, as fast as he could. And he gets to the ice block and his hand's just slipping. He can't pick this damn ice block up. And I'm like a grumpy old man. I'm just like picking them up, trodding along, kind of throwing them on. And end up beating him because he got so, he was just like panicking and trying to do it so quick that he started making mistakes, couldn't lift it. Bless him. And I ended up taking second, I think, in that comp <laughs> and, and like jumping over him in the placings. But... Yeah, sometimes just being grumpy and old helps. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, finally, I'd love to talk to you about what's your dream with what you do now? Because you've made such an incredible transition from competing to then, if you like, giving back to the sport on a daily basis, you and Liz, in terms of the knowledge, information, updates, news. What, say in 10 years' time, what will be your dream? Uh, I want to kind of continue doing more sort of commentating uh, gigs. That's kind of something I'm really interested in. Uh, obviously, keep developing the YouTube side of things. Uh, my coaching business is going very, very well, and we have a few few things that we're working on to expand that, uh, along with my brother who, who's involved with that now. Um, but just kind of keep enjoying what I'm doing. I, I love Strongman. I love being involved in it. I love seeing up-and-coming people progress. I'd love to see the sport keep progressing. You know, I think at the moment we kind of feel it's bigger than it is because we live in a little bubble um, and it has certainly grown a lot, but I do feel it can be so much better still. Um, so I want, in some way, I'd like to kind of look back in 10 years time and think I had a small part to play in improving it. And, and sometimes that means I have to be vocal and, and not very popular. 
because to, to create change, sometimes you've got to kind of stand your ground and say things because a lot of the guys think things, but they keep quiet about it because they don't want to upset anyone. Right. Um, I decided, you know, I'm going to just be honest and I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. It's, it's not about that, but we've got to kind of voice things and try and have change sometimes and make things better for, for everyone. You know, there's a time in Strongman where I won, you know, I won the British title and you get like a pat on the back, right. <laughs> you know, whereas things are getting better for athletes. There's more opportunities. Um, and, and I want to see the athletes earning some money from it, being able to do it professionally, because there's still a very small handful. But at the same time, I want to see promoters making money from it. I want to see the sport growing. I want to see sponsors coming into it that are, are really keen to help it grow. I'd love to run our own event one day, a little bit like um, the, the Shaw Classic, perhaps something like that. Um, but yeah, just want to keep seeing the sport grow, keep kind of giving back to it. And, and obviously kind of, you know, doing things for, for me and Liz as well. So if you do have your own show, what's it going to look like events wise? Because I have to say, I'm going to be the first person to go, Lars, you change the events, you change the outcomes. So what are the events going to be? <laughs> I, I cannot possibly announce the events just yet. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of factors that come into play, but I'd love to do, like I said, some different events, something like an old-fashioned backlift. I think, I think how cool would that look at the Strongman Classic? I yes. know it can't be done, but we're talking classic. Bring back maybe an old classic event, like a Paul Anderson-type lift where it was done, you know, early on where strongman was just a circus show uh, and you know some of those kind of crazy lifts that, that they did and, and you can lift such huge weights on something like that as well so it, it just visually would look impressive i know it's not a huge range of motion in terms of lift but the actual weight that you're lifting and, and something where a lot of the guys wouldn't be able to train for it uh, i think that would be cool and also i think the beautiful thing about strongman is some events have lots of movement, a keg toss, than other movements like that, but it, the, but there's still the jeopardy there. So whether it's the keg toss, will it go over the bar? This is, will you get it off the ground? Will it actually get off the ground? Yeah. And, and you, need, you need like all four corners of it kind of coming off. It's, um, yeah, I think, I think it would be cool. Lars, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time, mate. I look forward to doing it again at some point. Thank you, Radzi. It's always a pleasure talking to you, buddy. Naked bacon. One day, all bacon will be made this way.